Welcome to Change Lives Ministries and thank you for tuning in. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you will give us a spirit of wisdom and revelation so that we may see and taste Jesus, so that we may know the strength of his resurrection power, the hope of his calling. And Father, we pray that we may taste the goodness of Jesus Christ. We pray this. We pray that you will bless our time together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever say Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you
Today we are talking about the good news of Jesus and we as South Africans we really need a few doses of good news. Since the lockdown started almost on a daily basis we received the one bad report after the other. It was the one dose of bad news after the other. But before we get to the good news I'd just like to share a story out of our, our lives. On the Wednesday evening right before the lockdown started uh, we went to bed as usual our family about one o'clock the morning my eldest daughter came into the room and she said dad mom they're busy breaking in i can hear i can hear footsteps in the garden i can hear the dogs barking and i said to her oh, listen just relax if there was anybody in the garden or anybody was breaking in the alarms would have gone off already but she said no dad really i'm sure there's something going on and the next thing we heard we just heard this huge noise it sounded like a log fell onto the roof <clears throat> anyway we got up everybody wide awake now and we peered through the windows but it was pitch dark outside our lights on the outside uh, of our house weren't working very well at that stage and we were looking into the garden and trying to see what was going on but we couldn't see a thing after quite a while we decided now to go back to bed didn't hear anything no alarms going off and uh, but the girls were were very frightened so both of them took their beds and they slept in our room we locked the door and the next morning early next morning i got up and when i got up and i walked into the garden i saw that we had one of these massive trees that fell into our garden uh, but it, it, it's so big it almost covered the whole area of our backyard I was very grateful that firstly it didn't fall onto our roof, secondly it didn't fall over the wall, break the wall and thirdly it didn't fall over the wall onto our neighbor's house and we were very grateful for that. So we had to get people to cut up the logs and we had to clear that whole bed and now we have to start making a new bed. But that was a good experience for me, not in the sense that I like gardening. But it was amazing for me to see that we took a lot of small seeds and we planted them. And these small seeds, we obviously, we cultivated the ground, we gave them water and some sunlight and the right amount of sunlight. And, and, but what was amazing to see was how these seeds, just by themselves, naturally started to grow. And the one morning you started to see the plants coming up and a week or two later you could see how they were starting to grow exponentially and that was amazing to see. But what struck me was that there was, there was no oh, effort and striving and working hard from the seed spot to, to try and grow. It is something that happened naturally. When it comes to our relationship with God, we as Christians, we tend to struggle and we tend to strive and we tend to work hard and we try to perform and we try to do good works and, and Christianity becomes difficult and it becomes frustrating. And Paul had a similar experience and he said, For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, I, want, I don't know whether you've ever prayed this, thought this, or had the same frustrating experience that Paul had. If you do, I don't think that you've ever really understood the good news of Jesus, of what Jesus had done for you. Perhaps you haven't understood it, perhaps it hasn't been explained to you very well. So let's talk about this good news because when we are striving and performing and working and, and trying to earn God's favor, we are afraid of him and, and we don't have the confidence to go to him in difficult times for his help. Now 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. And all this is from God. It's God's work uh, who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Paul has got good news. He says, listen, that old man is dead and you are a new person and God has done that. So the first part of good news that I want to share with you is, is that God does not work on your shortcomings or your faults or your mistakes or the things that you are busy doing wrong. Now, just a, as an example, let's say that you have an, a, a, a problem with anger and, and, and you lose your temper regularly and then you swear and you tell people where to get off and how you realize as a Christian, but listen, I, I, I can't go around with this temper. I can't go around losing my temper uh, uh, every time things don't go my way. So you, you start praying about this, you start fasting about this, you start reading the Bible about this, you, you employ your willpower and, and you try to, to, you really try harder not to do these things and you might go to anger management classes, uh, you read self-help literature and you begin with a project where you work and strive to change and to become a better person and not to be so... so not to be so led by your temper. Well, let me tell me, let me tell you what I know about, about you in, in, in this instance. Um, God is not hearing that prayer. And, and you are not changing. And you are sitting with these difficulties. Because that old man is dead. God doesn't work on that old man. He works on the new man. Now, where am I coming from? Let's read Romans 6 together. For we all know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body ruled by sin might be done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that, that we will also live with him. And it's, just, it's extremely important that we realize that, and most of us are there, that we know that Christ died for us on the cross for our sins. Now, most Christians know that. But we don't believe and we struggle to believe and we don't, we don't think about the second part, that we died with Him. And just like we have to believe the first part, we have to believe the sec second part. I was crucified with Christ. That old man is dead. There is no power on earth that can change the old man and the old nature. And that's why Christ and God had to kill it off. That's why you had to die in Christ so that a new man could be resurrected. Romans 6 was, uh, verse 1 and 10 to 11 says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were therefore buried with Him through baptism into death in order, order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. For if we have been unified with Him in a death like this, we will certainly also be unified with Him in a resurrection like this. Then the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God. We have to count ourselves, we have to reckon ourselves dead to sin. And alive to God. I remember quite a few years ago of a sermon that a pastor did and he brought a casket into the church. Now most people are, are, a, bit, are a bit reluctant to come near a casket and he opened up the casket on the, on the platform and inside of the casket he put a mirror and then he invited the congregation to come up to the platform and to look into that casket. And the moment that they looked into the casket, a lot of people were skeptical and they were afraid and a bit superstitious and, and they weren't prepared to do it. But the moment that they looked into that casket, they saw themselves as a reflection in that mirror. And that was the message that day, that you are 
dead in Christ I was when Christ was crucified I was crucified with him and we need to believe this and we need to mark, make that make that part of our faith in our relationship with God so the old man died with Jesus and God is not working on your shortcomings on your mistakes on your character flaws he is not working there let's use another example Say, for example, that you battle with anxiety, you get very anxious, uh, you tend to develop ulcers, you sleep badly, and now you start praying about it. I would like to tell you that God doesn't work on the old man. He works, he works on peace. He works on the new man. So when God starts working with you, he will, he will start to explain to you how peace works. He would like to take you into the rest of our Lord Jesus Christ. But I can hear you, you reasoning with me and saying, but, but listen, I've, I've read a few scriptures in the Bible where God says, but don't fear and don't live in fear and don't be anxious. That's true. But when God does that, He does that by working on the new man. If you take Paul's writings, if you take a book like Romans or Ephesians or Galatians or Colossians, if you take, take Romans, the first eight chapters, God tells us who we are. He, he tells us about our new identity in Christ. And, and only in the last four chapters, he, he tells about, okay, what does God expect of you? So he first tells us what our identity is, and then he tells us how to act. So he works on the new man. If you take a book like Galatians, the first three chapters, it's your identity, your new man, who you are in Christ, and then, okay, well, how you act as a new man. So God doesn't work on the old man, he works on the new man. So he doesn't focus on your behavior, but your identity. So he's not working on your character flaws and your shortcomings. He's going to tell you who you are in your new man. And, and, and you are the righteousness of God in Christ and you are in the right standing with God and you are in Jesus and you are a new man and you are dead to sin. Those are the things that he will be working on. He doesn't focus on your performance, but your acceptance. We tend to come to God and we want to work and change ourselves and God says, listen, you are my beloved son or daughter in whom I'm well pleased. You are accepted. He doesn't look to the old, but he looks to the new. He shifts us from law to grace. Now law is us trying to please God. Grace is God doing something for us. He is giving us the operational system so that we have the ability to serve him. He doesn't work on the negative, but the positive. So he would like to encourage, encourage us, don't be sin conscious, but be aware of Jesus. Now, one of the most amazing transformations in nature is when a worm curls up and spins itself into a cocoon and a butterfly comes out. And we tend to think, but listen, um, we have to change our lives. Listen, God doesn't give you a changed life. He gives you a new life, a totally new life. You are born again in Christ and now He will strengthen the new man so that you can grow up in the new man. 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, And because of Him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption. We should remember that Christ is righteousness for us. He paid for our sins. And when we believe in Jesus, we, we get into the right relationship with God. But we should also remember that He is also sanctification to us. So it's not my job to try and change me. It's not my job to, to try and become holy. It's like those seeds striving, working, uh, battling to grow. No, it happens by self. Um, because of how they were created and now Jesus Christ lives in me and he becomes my sanctification so so he does the saving part but he also does the sanctification part and that's very important to remember the second part of good news that I would like to share with you is that Satan's secret plans for you have been revealed now as you are listening to the sermon I can hear you reasoning with me and telling me but 
listen, I've, I'm losing my temper. I, 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 I look at stuff and I lust after stuff and after ladies and, and, and I tend to lie and I tend to swear and I take things that are not mine and, and sometimes I'm just lazy and, 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 and I can hear you reasoning with me, telling me, but listen, my flesh is alive and well. Well, that's one of the things that Satan really, that's one of his strategies with us. And the first thing that he does with us is, is he comes to us and he says, did, did God really say that you are dead to sin? Did God really promise that he will provide for you? So that's what he did with Adam and Eve. And that's, that, that's what he will, would like to do with you. He would come to you and say, are you really dead to sin? Now that's just something that the Bible says. It's not true about you. But we need to believe the word and stand on the word. The second thing that he does is, is that he wants us to focus on ourselves and he wants us to do something for ourselves. The moment that I, that I start praying about, but Lord, just I've got this dim temper and I need to change and, 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 and please help me to change, I'm focusing on myself. And when I look at myself, I see my character flaws, I see my shortcomings, we need to look at Jesus. When God looks at us, He looks at us through the eyes of Jesus. He sees us perfect and whole. Satan's number one strategy is not to get us to sin, but for us to look at ourselves and to look for power and, and relief in ourselves. And the third thing that he does is that he is the father of the lie, or he is the father of lies. Uh, John 8.44 says, You belong to the father, the, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So the devil would like to come to you and say, Listen, ach man, you've been an alcoholic your whole life. You can't change. You are hopeless. You will never change. You will never able to, 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 be, to be able to overcome this addiction. And that's a lie. So he will say, did God really say? He would like you to focus on yourself and not Jesus. And he would try to convince you that you, he would lie to you that you can't change and, 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 and live in victory concerning these things. In 1937, the Japanese, they had an, a, a war with the Chinese. I don't know whose idea it was that the small Japanese nations should take on the, the Chinese. Not a good idea. But anyway, in the beginning, uh, the Japanese prevailed because they had good tanks. And then they developed a very interesting strategy. They would take a sniper and he would, he would fire a shot at a tank and then nothing happened. And then a little, while, a little while later, he would fire another shot and then nothing happened. And then a little while later, he would fire another shot. Eventually, the tank commander would pop out his head out of the tank and then the, the, the sniper would take him out. And that's how they overcame the, the tanks of the Japanese army. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do with you. He wants you to stick your head out of, you are secure in Jesus. He wants you to get out of that, that, that protection of Jesus. And he wants you to look at yourself. And in the moment he does that, um, he's got us in a place where he can manipulate us. The third uh, part of good news that I would like to share with you is that there is now no condemnation. There is now no condemnation. Romans 8.1, the Passion Translation says, So now the case is closed. There remains no accusing voice of condemnation against those who are joined in life union with Jesus, the Anointed One. Now, we know that Jesus died for us. We know that we are covered with His blood. And God says there is no condemnation towards us. 
But we tend to battle with the fact that we condemn ourselves for, for doing the wrong things. The, the good things that I want to do, I don't do. And the wrong things that I don't want to do, I tend to do that. And then we tend to, do, to condemn ourselves. And the Bible says there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. The moment people start talking uh, or when you experience thoughts and feelings of guilt, shame and condemnation, you can know that that is religion's voice, that's the enemy's voice, that's the flesh speaking. But that is not God. You are not condemned. And therefore, I have the confidence to go to Him with my problems, with my fears, with the things that I need help with. The last part of good news that I would like to share with you is that the Holy Spirit also gets into the fight and into the boxing room. Galatians 5.16 says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. And I never realized when I read this that we should know that the Holy Spirit, when we accept Jesus into our lives, he lives in us through the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit, He makes it His task to handle the flesh, to subdue the flesh, to sort out the flesh. The Amplified Version says, For the sinful nature has its desire which is opposed to the Spirit. And the desire of the Spirit opposes the sinful nature. So the Spirit opposes the sinful nature. That's good news. He's, he is taking over the fight. I don't have to strain and struggle and battle and try myself. The Holy Spirit is in me. And if I walk according to the Spirit and if I listen to the Spirit, the Spirit will sort this out. I don't have to do that. I can just rest. For these two, the sinful nature and the Spirit, are in direct opposition to each other, continually in conflict, so that you as believers do not always do the good things that you want to do. Now, when we talk about the flesh, it's about sinful things, but it's also about doing things in our own strength. Galatians 5, 19 says, The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immor immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Now, this is the flesh. Now, but the flesh is also me trying to do something out of my own strength, out of my own abilities to please God, to become godly. And now the Bible says, but the fruit of the Spirit, it's what the Spirit gives to you, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The, these are the things that will be deposited into you through the Spirit, and He will let it grow into your life. So to summarize, Jesus is salvation for us. The Spirit is salvation in us. Galatians 2.19 says, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. I have been crucified with Christ. Now, we need to, we need to believe this. I need to, to believe that I have been crucified with Christ. There are two substitutions. He died for me on the cross. I died with Him on the cross. And then He will live in me through the Holy Spirit. Two substitutions. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. I'd just like to end off with the story of Bruce Wilkinson that I have, I have told this story before. Now, Bruce Wilkinson, 35, 40, 40 years ago, um, he started Walk Through the Bible. And he was a varsity professor, and they had uh, morning devotions. And there was a professor that each morning he handled the devotions and he brought the sermon. And he would get up in the mornings and then he would start his sermon, quote, quote a verse, quote another one, lead to another one, quote one, quote one. And then he would quote about 25, 30 verses. After the first sermon, Bruce walked out and he said, listen, I think this guy has just quoted all the verses that he, that he knows. 
But the next morning he did the same thing, the morning after that the same thing. But one day he actually sat down and quoted it and he quoted 30 other verses. By the end of the week he said, wow, this guy, this guy has got such a gift. Just imagine what it would mean for my organization if I could employ and get such a gifted teacher to be part of Walk Through the Bible. So he went to him and he asked him if he would consider to, to be one of the teachers on this, in, in this company that he started. And the professor said, no, I'm not going to do that. But then he said, but what I'm going to do is, I'm going to pray that you will fall madly in love with Jesus and the rest will follow. And that's my prayer for you. I pray that you will fall madly in love with Jesus, that you will have a spirit of wisdom and revelation to understand what He's done for you, and the rest will follow. A quick to-do list. Number one, believe. We believe that Jesus died on the cross for us for our sins, but we need to believe that we, are, that we died with Him and that we are dead for sin. The second thing is, is that we, don't, we need to learn not to trust in our own abilities in the flesh. Thirdly, Jesus died for you. Let him also live through you, through the Holy Spirit, the two substitutions. Let's pray together. Father, I pray that you will open our eyes for the good news of Jesus, of making us his children. And, and becoming part of the family and for dying, us, for dying for us on the cross and, and that we have been crucified with Him and that He lives in us and that He is for us the righteousness but also the sanctification. We pray, Father, that, that this will create a totally new and a different life in our lives. We pray, Father, that we will taste and see the goodness of Jesus. We pray this, we ask this in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. Amen. There's going to be an opportunity to sow into this ministry. The banking details will be on the screen. The zapper codes, the snap scan codes, as well as the, uh, the banking info. And if there's a few of our international listeners and you would like to sow into this ministry, the SWIFT code will, will also be on the screen. And just remember that God always loves a cheerful giver. Let's receive the blessing. Father, we pray that we will experience the love of God and the grace of Jesus and the working of the Holy Spirit in and through us. We pray this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you for tuning in and may God bless you richly.